Hi, 1926 Brooklyn, New York. Let's go back. Tell me what was going on when you were just a little boy. Well, we lived in a neighborhood that was mostly Jewish at that time. And we didn't stay there until I was five years old. But the only excitement we had, one of the kids lived on the first floor, and the trains were that close to his window. So we used to sit on the fire escape and wave at them as they go by. Oh, wow. And that was a big excitement. The only thing I had, I had a trauma that happened. You know what a putty blower is? A little hollow tube that you blow. I had a friend named Philly. And in New York, all the basements, you would go down a staircase to go to the basement where you had the heat and all that. And we used to go chasing each other with the putty blowers. And he tripped, and the thing went down his throat. And he was gurgling blood up. And his father ran the candy store in the building. And all I knew to do was to go get his father. And he ended up being paralyzed from that. But that was when I was four years old when I saw that. That's my earliest recollection. And then after that, we moved. We moved to the sunny side of the street. We went over to East New York. And we had sunshine blowing on the house. And I couldn't believe they didn't turn the light off. <laughs> what does your dad do for a living? He was what they call a presser. Women's clothes, these big pressing machines, and he'd sit there and it was piecework. And that's what he did. He raised nine kids with that job. But in the hard times, he worked two jobs at a time and stayed on the machine so he could support us. I have a lot of respect for him. Now, nine children, you were born right before the Depression. Do you know if it affected your family, the Great Depression? I didn't even know what was going on. My father would not take welfare from nobody. And he earned everything he could get. And we, we, we lived in a ten a nice tenement. It was a tenement, it wasn't an apartment house. But we had heat, we had electricity, and we had a, we were poor, we didn't know we were poor. And everybody that could worked and chipped into the family. I didn't know there was a depression until my father was a Roosevelt fan, 1932. I recall going on the street with him handing out leaflets to get rid of Hoover. Yeah. And, uh, and then, but as far as growing up, we're just kids on the street. So what did you guys do for fun? You know, what at a young age, did you have something that you really well, cling to? I, you know, any way you could make some money, mom would find ways to increase the vital of what we call the purse. When I was around nine years old, and we lived in a neighborhood, and a man came around and put together a Jewish choir uh -huh. of all these kids. But we didn't have, we were all around the synagogues we had were storefronts. They didn't need a choir. But he put the choir together, and they go up in the, oh, the more elite neighborhood where they had the big shuls or temples, and he would hire us out for the high holy holidays. <laughs> And at that time, I was a soprano. And I stayed, did that in the time I was nine until I was 12 years old. Oh. So we did that in the summertime. And in the wintertime, as soon as I could figure out how to build an airplane model, I would build an airplane model until my mother threw me out of the house because that stuff you glue it with is called dope, and it stinks. So I'd be out in the wintertime in the back alley building my model, flying airplanes with the wind. With the, with the wood balls of wood. Yeah, yeah. And that's, and what was it that, that drew you to flying? I guess it's my older brother. I have a brother named Salt. He's gone from me now. And he was, my, I'm always mechanically inclined, and he loved airplanes. And I had another brother between us, but he liked them too. So it kind of fled back onto me. Yeah. And the people have asked me, when was the first time I became interested in airplanes? I said, when I stuck my head out of the womb. <laughs> that's, that's the only thing I came yeah. I'd get magazines and fly and go to the library and get all the World War I, Lafayette Escadrille, all that kind of stuff, yeah. and read all about all the different pilots, Eddie Rickenbacker and all those guys. Yeah. And I followed, and that's where I did it, because I had to work, and I was working in a box factory until I was 13, 14 years old, kind of under the table deal. And my mother was going to the theater, and she found out they needed an usher there. They were going to the service. 
And then Mr. Y said, if he fits the uniform, he could have the job. So I fit the uniform, so I got the job. <laughs> there you go. I got made 30 cents an hour. And that's what I did, besides going to school and... Now, now, when you were uh, working in the theater there, did you meet any of the stars? Yeah, I met Bob Crosby. Bing Crosby? Bob Crosby, oh, Bob Crosby. brother. And Kay Kaiser. My job was when they came in on a Tuesday night, they come to the... It was in the Lowe's Circuit. It was one of them fancy big theater, uh, theaters with the organ player and everything else in Brooklyn, in, East, in Brownsville. And they would practice before they went to Paramount in New York City. And I, I, was, I was in the balcony squad. In time anybody get rough, I'd throw them out of the theater. <laughs> and my job was to escort them when they came in to take them to the back. So I got to meet a lot of them. I remember Kay Kaiser. I don't know if you remember who he was in the musical Nuts. And uh, Bob Crosby. And I stayed there until I got ready to go to Oklahoma. There's an airport out there. It's still there, Fort Bennett Field. Back to that, so it used to be oh, and whenever I, I didn't have a bicycle, my brother sold a bicycle before I get my hands on it. We were supposed to hand it down, he sold it. And they used to rent bicycles for 25 cents an hour. So whenever I wasn't working at the theater, I'd rent a bicycle and bicycle out to Floyd Bennett Field. And hang around the guys, if you needed a Coke or something, I'd run and go get it for them. You need the windshield wipers wiped off, I'd wipe them off. And in the evening, I'd stay around and people would come out and they'd rent a plane to fly around the city as a tour. And most of the time it was a guy and a gal sitting in the back seat. So I always had the right hand side was empty, so they'd come on. I hop on and go with us and I'd go fly around the city. Yeah, yeah. He wouldn't let me handle the controls, but I didn't do that till I got to Tulsa. Do you remember your grandparents at all? No. My grandparents were still in the old country. Okay, so you're wiped out in the Holocaust. Oh, I'm sorry. So your folks came over? To, father, did they come over together, your parents? No. My father had a more interesting story than I did. He was 11 years old. He ran away from Russia, got under the Tsar, and he found himself traveling across Europe, and he ended up in London. And he was on the streets, and that's why he had a big family, because he'd always see these nice, fleet people we had families, and someday I'm going to have a family, as many kids as I can have. That's why he had 12 children, because he wanted a big family. And he ended up, when he got to be old enough to go in the army, he joined the British Army. And he ended up in South Africa, fighting the Boers, the term, before the turn was with Kitchener, General Kitchener. He got captured by the Boers. <laughs> they stripped, the Boers were a guerrilla organization, they didn't have standing army and they couldn't keep prisoners. They were Dutch. And they would capture them, they'd take all their, they needed their uniforms for clothes. They'd take their guns away from them, take the thing, and they'd get them stripped naked and they point them toward the lines and says, you head back, we catch you one more time, we'll kill you. So the Kitchener would send them back to England. He didn't keep, he got back to England, he's walking the streets and he, I remember they were, they didn't know they had press gangs that late. We ended up, they picked them up and put them in the Navy. And he stayed in the Navy for a year. And then when he got out, then he did different jobs, met my mother. And then he started, he and his friend decided to come to America. England wasn't doing it for them. So they came, the best I could figure out, they either came to Canada or Ellis Island. Whenever they'd get it straight. But they got over here, started little businesses that they could do as a shoemaker. And this thing. And as soon as he got enough money to send for my mother, she wouldn't count unless she brought her sister. So he convinced my his friend to marry the sister to bring her over here. And he ain't forgave my father to the day he died. <laughs> <laughs> she was something else. Yeah. Dr. Sarah. Yeah, yeah. Now you mentioned uh, 12 total kids for your dad. So in, you said earlier there were nine of you. So three passed away at a young age? Yeah, well, the boy, uh, my father would never talk about it. His name was Alex. But I, he seemed like he was a, caught a cold or something, and he died. Eva was a baby girl about three years old. The story, the story we get, he wouldn't talk about it. But uh, we got it from the older kid. 
and they lived on the third floor here, and she went out on the fire escape and somehow got over and fell to her death. Oh boy. So he, so he never lived in a house that wasn't on the bottom floor. Yeah. I always asked the older sister, they wouldn't, wouldn't talk about it. it wasn't a, he just, that's history, they're gone, that's and, it. And the third one was still born? She was still there. Yeah. What was the name of the high school you went to? Alexander Hamilton. Okay. Now, after high school, was it college, service, no, or work? Happened? I was looking at service time. This was 1943. My brother was a director of flight operations. He'd been in the Air Force, and they went to start this flying school. And the guy by the name of Captain Balfour was a World War I ace, knew all the military, and he needed a team of mechanics to start his aviation flying school, even though Spartan was already a civilian flying school. So he convinced my brother that he could buy out of the Air Force before the war. My brother was 24 years old, the director of flight maintenance in his flying school. And I always wanted to go out there and join him before I went into service so I'd get some uh, on hands time before I went and I was going to join him. Uh, I didn't know which branch of the military I was going to join. But I went out there and went to work as an apprentice mechanic. And when it came time to get old enough, I wanted to sign on as a cadet. And we had cadets there and I'd, mm -hmm. I loved them. I used to bum rides when the guys used to flight test the airplanes. I had a, I had a lot of fun. So I went down to join the Navy Air Force because I thought they had a nice uniform. <laughs> I get down to the Naval Recruiting Office. I was supposed to meet him at 8 o'clock. I get to right next to the recruiting office, the Air Force Recruiting Office. Well, I went to the Navy guy. He wasn't there yet, so I sat on the floor and just waited for him to come. The Air Force guy said, you'll be sitting on the floor. Get in here. He said, you going to go try to get naval aviation? I said, yeah, I'm going to fly up a carriage. He said, let me show you something. He had a big picture of a carrier out in the middle of nowhere. He said, you're up here, that's down there. Then he showed me another picture, a beautiful Parksdale field, or whatever, with beautiful runways. You come home at night, you go into town, meet the girls. You're out on the ship, you're sleeping at the... By the time the, <laughs> by the, time the Navy got there, I saw, took the test and was an aviation cadet <laughs> in the reserve. And the guy said, you waiting for me? I said, not anymore, I'm in the Army now. That's how I joined the Air Force. I went back and, and in April of 1944, they called me up and started my cadet training, but they closed the program down there before I got the pre-flight. They at the same time they closed the WASP down, the women flying car, because they had, they put the P-51 on line. They could fly it all the way to Berlin. When they could, they could intercept the Luftwaffe. Well, our airplanes couldn't fly that far. So the Germans would wait so they went back and then they shoot down the bombers. Once they did that, they shot up the Luftwaffe pretty good. And they weren't losing any bombers. So they didn't need that many pilots. So they offered me to go to AMA, Flight Engineer School, which was the best thing that could have happened to so me. Did you go into uh, Europe or the Pacific? No. What happened, once I got out of cadets, they sent me to AM School at Amarillo, Texas. And that was a six months course to get fully acquainted with the B-17 and all the airplanes. I got out, I was supposed to go to gunnery school and then go over to Europe. But I was in the top 10 of my class and the B-17G model came online. It was almost a totally different B-17. And they needed the train guys to do that, so they sent me out to Hollywood, California, Burbank. And I was there for, for two months. I went through the Lockheed Factory School getting trained on the B-17Gs. And from there I ended up in gunnery school. And before I completed it, they needed B-29 mechanics. Again, they get the top guys in the top classes and send it to a crash course on B-29s. And I ended up at the, back in Amarillo. And I love Amarillo, great town. You know, I like the weather, wait a minute, you get another one. And when I got through at Amarillo, we went to school at Amarillo from 12 o'clock at night to 6 o'clock in the morning. That's how they had the schools running. Right. To get enough mechanics and flight engineer, flight test. Always what they call the ETS guy. Airplane was all electric, so I don't know every wire in that place in flight. 
case they got shut up to make the repairs and fly. We were training in Barksdale Field. We were going over to Kurt LeMay, General Kurt LeMay's outfit at 20th Airport, I think. When they dropped the bomb and that, that ended, I was going over, so I never got out of the States. Yeah, yeah. And then from then, well then, that's how I didn't get overseas. Okay. Now where did you meet Edna? I was going through Spartan School of Aeronautics in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I was working nights in the shops because I was, as part-time worker, I'd get more experience. And one Saturday night, they didn't have any airplanes in the shops. They said, you guys take the evening off and go to a movie or something. And I was living in the dorms out at the field. So I put on my shirt, my tie, and my jacket. Back in those days, you used to get dressed up to go to the movies. And I came out, and there in our uh, cafeteria was all stripped out, and there was a dance going on. I figured, I don't want to go to a movie. Let's see what's going on at the dance. So I went into the dance, and I looked around, and nothing excited me. It just looked like I.G. would double, or the gals were there. It didn't excite me. About that time, the door opened up, and four girls came in from downtown. They had gone to the YWCA thinking it was a dance there. They used to have dances like that all the time. And they said, there's one out of Spartan, so she came with, I saw this beautiful little gal, and I latched on to her, and I wouldn't leave her alone. And that's how I met her. And then where did you guys settle down? Uh, we settled in Tulsa, and I got married in 1950. And our company, we were doing a lot of corporate airplanes. Like we were taking these old World War II airplanes and making corporate airplanes out of them. Well, and we had a contract. Every time one of these things went down, we sent them a mechanic to check it out and find out what it needed and send the team either changing it. So that's how I kept my flying up. The company had a plane. If I couldn't get there by an airline, I'd get the company plane. Or with the company part of we fly over there and then I get my flying time. I thought I'd spend the rest of my life in Tulsa, but we, and we had union problems. They were, another company took us over, so I stayed in Tulsa from 1947, got married in 50, and then I moved to Harringen, Texas, where we moved our company down there to South Texas. And what was the company, the name of the company? Spartan Aircraft Company. Okay. It was a division of the school. When it happened, when I was working part-time, I got in, in with the people there, and I stayed with them after I got out of school, and I ended up being a general foreman and a assistant superintendent for a while. I was the one that closed the shop down while the other guys were opening it there. Yeah. And then I went down to Harlingen, and I stayed in Harlingen until 1977, but we sold the company to a Dallas company called Dallas Aeromotive. And there was South Dallas Air Motor, Southwest Air Motor, and it became combined. Cooper Bessemer took them over, and I stayed with them until 1981, when they shut down and became Avial into a small company. Somebody sent my resume out. To, actually, with my daughter was working for a company that she lived in Fort Worth, and she worked for a company that was sending out applicants, and she sent my the girl sent my resume. The minute they saw the background that I had, they called me and they hired me. And I went to work for General Dynamics, and I retired from them. Now, 1980, uh, you also met uh, Jimmy Doolittle. That was an interesting story. There's a motel right across the street from General Dynamics. I think it's Green, Green something. My buddy, by the name of Cleveland, was a manager. We were both on a hot project and we're working together. And he used to get tickets to all these different uh, uh, affairs. Uh, the uh, the Thunderbirds, he's coming to town, they'd have a dinner for him. We went to visit with the Thunderbirds. You know? Well, he said, hi, oh, I got a good one. When I go tonight, and, uh, I said, what is it? Jimmy Doodle's Raiders are gonna have it over here. I said, what time do you want me there? So I went with him there and we had a dinner and I, he had a raider at every table. And then they wrote, showed movies, and it was the funniest thing. You see it on TV. Where the, and one of these guys took up with the flaps up. He almost went in the drink. And he was there. And they were razzing him. And that's what's funny. 
you get the so we got to Jimmy sit up there to greet the people that were guests and I said I want to go meet Jimmy Doodle I, I got to shake his hand but uh, he wasn't my hero for the raid he was my hero when he was a race pilot back in the 30s so he worked for Shell Oil Company he was a vice president of Shell in fact, if it wasn't for Jimmy, we wouldn't have had airplanes with 100 octane gas. The Germans didn't have 100 octane. You'll get me technical again. But uh, I got on the line. My buddy said, what are you going to talk to him about? I said, I ain't going to talk about the raid. I was going to ask him how he liked. There was a little airplane at that time called a GB Racer. It was about this big, had an engine about that big, and stubby wings. And it was the fastest thing, but nobody could maneuver it. Jimmy could. And I went up to him and I said, he liked you to call him Jimmy. He didn't like you to call him General. I said, Jimmy, how would you like to be flying that GB? Let me tell you about that damn man. You get, you get yourself killed in that damn thing. He said, I flew it one time and I parked that thing. And the guy that only crashed it and tore it up. <laughs> and when we sat there and talked about different Roscoe Turner and all them guys that he knew them. I didn't know them. And he just wanted to talk about racing. But the people were lying there, well, what's going on? <laughs> And finally, he said, you better move on. His wife was still alive, so I shook her name with Joe. Her name was Joe. Yeah. Now, you and Edna, um, did you guys have any involvement with the Jewish community? No, I, I, I was so wrapped up in aviation and growing through the chairs. I never had time like that. I'd work 12, 14 hours a day. Yeah. Yeah. I was involved in Boy Scouts. I was assistant scoutmaster of the Boy Scout troop. Oh, that's something else I did as a kid. I was a Boy Scout. Yeah. And then I ended up joining a, a military organization, so I'd like an ROTC, so I'd get ready for the military, which really paid off. Yeah. Now, in your lifetime, you've lived through so many momentous occasions. Of course, you know, World War II, um, President Kennedy assassination in Dallas, uh, the Vietnam era, uh, the moon landing, something good for the first time in 69. Of course, the tragedy of 9-11. Was there something on the national scene that really affected you where you know exactly where you were when it happened? Yes, sir, the 9-11 thing. I got up in the morning, turned the TV on. Well, okay, let me back up a little bit. When I was in furlough in New York, a B-25 flew into the Empire State Building in the, in the 40s. And I was down the street and I heard the crash. And it was in all the papers, you know, a B-25 flying too low. I turned the TV on, all of a sudden I see they said the building is burning. It took one of the twin towers. I said, oh, somebody must have flown into the building. All of a sudden, I spot another airplane going, and what's he doing, taking pictures of it? And he flew it right into the building. <gasps> I went into a state of shock. And I never got my eyes off that TV set all the rest of the day. Yeah. That, that really got to me. What was the happiest time in your life? Actually, the happiest time in my life, other than my family the day I soloed the airplane. Yeah. That, that instructor got out of that airplane. That airplane got quiet. I could screw up on the way and nobody could yell at me. <laughs> and flying in solo and I took it around the field and went out there and I landed without tearing it up. And I, was, I couldn't wait to get home and tell everybody and where I was boarding that I soloed that day. That yeah. was, I'd have to say, I, I'm not counting family. Right, right. Everything with the family is supreme to that. But what I liked best was getting my solo flight in there. Yeah. That means I could go out and be Baron Richthofen. Now, you and uh, Edna uh, have three children, a boy and two girls, seven grandkids, and four great-grandkids. What advice does great-granddad have for that next generation? My kids. I, I raised them where they could think for themselves. My son got his daughter on his own when he's 16. And he retired from Kmart and he's now working for a, he, for a dental company, managing a dock in the box places. Uh, Aspen Dental, give him a point of plug. And uh, he works, he's a sharp kid. My oldest daughter wanted to know what she should study. And I told her you ought to be a teacher. She loved to teach the kid, her younger sister. And she said, why would I want to be a teacher? It's always a job, you can find a job doing it. So both my girls are teachers. 
They're all good kids. All my kids are great. Well, hi, thanks for doing this today. Oh, that's it? That's it. You did a great job, man.